actually a fourth product we'll be introducing towards the end. So first thing we want to talk about is what is Artifactory? You know, developers out there develop products all over the place. Uh, no matter what you're doing, whether it's C++, whether it's Java, whether it's .NET, whether it's NPM, with, you know, you're doing things in Node, uh, Python, you name it. And these developers depend on things, and these, they depend on sources, you know, whether it's Ruby Gems, uh, whether you're building even RPMs where you're building packages and you have remote dependencies. That's where Artifactory comes in. If I'm a developer and I have an organization where I'm using something like Artifactory, you know, we don't manage the source code. We actually just manage the binaries, which that code actually depends on. And let's see here. Oh, sorry, somebody just put a little thing in there. Sorry, I'm not used to the uh, the key. I'm not used to the actual webinar uh, UI for this. Um, so now we have Artifactory, and when Artifactory is in place. Uh, you can go through and, and have it so those dependencies are cached in a repository. If you're familiar with Artifactory then, you know, those libraries uh, will be stored there. And the next time you go to pull them, you'll have a copy of them um, instead of having to go out to the remote repository itself. You know, also too, uh, you can also have different package types. Uh, please let me know, by the way, if, uh, if I'm speaking too quickly or anything like that. Um, so when you have these other dependencies, you can cache them through Artifactory, and this allows consistency. One of the things I always explain to people when they ask me what does Artifactory do and what does JFrog do, uh, simplicity, so ease of use for developers and also for CI, CD systems and your entire development structure. Uh, it, consistency by allowing you to have the same sort of libraries and usage that you have uh, from your developer all the way through to your production environments. And then security, because one of the other pack things we'll talk about today also, I guess we'll say a fifth pack product is called X-Ray. And X-Ray gives you the ability to scan these packages and look for anything nefarious. And I'll give you an example of one when we get to that point, uh, one that was actually highly impactful, uh, ex extremely, actually recently. So I'm a developer, I check my system, and I, you know, I put my code together, I grab my dependencies, um, and then when I'm done with my initial build on my, you know, from my desktop or you know, wherever workstation I'm at, I'll check that into a source code. And of course, this is where the CIC, CID system comes in. So we might have various different types of CI servers. Today we'll be talking about Jenkins, but there's many out there. Integrate uh, with most of them. So supply our API. And if you don't, we don't have it available for that, you can add it to other scripting components and actually use Artifactory for this also. Now you might have things where you're doing builds, and we have those builds right now. In a standard environment, if you don't have Artifactory, every time these, those machines run to do those builds, it'll have to go out and get the original packages that were in place uh, the developer used. If you have Artifactory in place, it makes sure that the developer and the CI CD system are using the exact same um, uh, you know, binaries for those builds. This supplies consistency. So now that you have consistency in your build, it makes ensures that what the developer intended is also the same thing that the CI system is producing. From there, you can take that information, and when that build is done, you can actually store all that build info back into JFrog, and you put it back into Artifactory. Not only the binaries that are actually from those builds, but actually the build information itself. We collect the build information and we store that. So this way you have a system of record of not only where the what binaries are being used, you know, the dependencies, the libraries, all that, but when you build those, those items, you actually take them and you store them into Artifactory and then also have all the build information around that. This allows you to go back and do tracking and have that single source of truth. Now, if you're going into something like, you know, adding additional metadata, so you, so you have some sort of QA system, whether it's, you know, vulnerability testing, a manual QA system or whatever, uh, you can actually add additional metadata to that build if you wanted to, or to those components. Uh, this allows you to have even greater system record. I mean, when it comes down to it, not only does Artifactory store the binaries and store the code and the build, not the code, but the builds, but also allows you to have this massive amount of metadata and the metadata helps you make better decisions in your process, and especially in your organization. Now when you get into things like, uh, you know, we'll talk about it later on, but you can also, uh, you know, also have like provisioning servers. You know, in this case, we're gonna be talking about Docker. So one of the things you can do is you can actually set up um, Artifactory as a Docker registry. So this way, instead of having to go and store your Docker images in some sort of other repository, you can actually go through the entire process of designing, building your containers for Docker, 
putting them through a CI process, putting them through your QA process, and then storing them in Artifactory, and then accessing them locally so you can have your provisioning servers go out there and push it out to the world. This allows you to have a one-stop place where you can store all this information and that's controlled by you and your organization. And lastly, if you want to do things where you say your company or your corporation or whatever you do uh, creates Docker images or builds or anything um, that can be distributed to an endpoint, we have a product called Bintray. Now, Bintray is a very interesting product because what it is is it's a, uh, a way for you to distribute. And now the Bintray product rides on top of Akamai CDN. So when you push it out, it's treated as a repository type and you put it into, the, into Bintray itself and then distribute it globally. You can also restrict it. You can also whitelist it, blacklist it, sign it, whatever you want to do. Um, that's a whole nother discussion. But it's, you know, we have an entire ecosystem based around this. You know, we have Artifactory for storing your repository, you know, your binary components. Then we have X-Ray for, score, you know, that can go in and do tests for like anything nefarious. And then we have Bintray for distribution. So Artifactory, Bintray, and X-Ray all work together in conjunction to make sure that your system has consistency through the organization. So today, one of the things we're going to be talking about is we're going to be you know, concentrating more on the side of actually on the CI servers and how Artifactory comes in for this. And we're going to show you how using Jenkins in a pipeline build um, with the Artifactory plugin installed in Jenkins will allow you to build your Docker containers, store them in Artifactory, um, do whatever kind of tests you need to do with them, and then give you the ability to actually you know, push them out there and put them out there in the world. Um, in this case, we'll be talking about a couple different things. We'll be talking about how to pull those dependencies in. We'll talk about the build. We'll talk about doing a quick check on that, on that actual, you know, the container itself uh, for consistency. And then we can send it through X-Ray for some scanning. And when the scanning is complete, we'll promote it. So we're going to take it from one repository, or in other words, the initial uh, Docker registry where we stored things, and then taking that and putting that into another repository. And when we put it into another repository, we can use that for distribution. Promotion is a very interesting idea in this case because in a typical situation, if you don't have something um, where you can actually move, uh, you know, move your builds from one to another to another, um, it, you know, it becomes very hard. Where in other words, if you use a promotion pipeline, which we're gonna be talking about today, especially with Jenkins, it allows you to have your development builds and then go through a series of quality gates. Um, the whole thing is, is that in a typical process like this, you want to have you know, everything from you know, the initial development process. Uh, you'll put that into a central repository server. You might put it through some sort of system testing environment uh, where you might do consistency checking, any sort of vulnerability checking. Uh, from there, you might go to a manual QA stage or to an other automated QA stage, whatever your company has for a process. And when it sits past those actual uh, those gates, it'll be put into a promoted into a production environment or a production release or a production distribution. So the thing with Artifactory is, is that we have a plugin, uh, and like I said, other CI systems too. We have stuff for like Bamboo, VTSS. There's, there's a ton of systems we have out there. Um, but there is a plugin available. This actually should be updated. Uh, we actually have updated the numbers by then. But what this plugin does is allows two things. It allows Artifactory to you know, take the build information that's produced by Jenkins, the, all the components from there. It also allows Jenkins to be contextually aware of Artifactory. So when you're building your pipeline scripts, when you're building them and, and putting together, you can actually seed all that information inside of your scripting um, so that it does know about Artifactory. And we'll go through that. I have a couple of good examples of this. So the thing is, is that when it comes down to, we talk about, you know, uh, let's, let's talk about basically CI in general. If you go back to the early days of all sorts of development and stuff, you might have something like Cruise Control, which was uh, fascinating at the time. It allowed you to control your releases. But, and the thing is, is you can write those releases and you would write them in some sort of XML format. Uh, you can store them in your CI, you know, any sort of like source control system. You can version them. You can write to them. You can write all your instructions on what you needed to do to construct your builds. Um, and, and it, but it became kind of a nightmare. It wasn't exactly easy to maintain. Uh, it was, it was just horrible. Then Jenkins and, you know, Hudson initially came along. And when you went through that, it allowed you to go through and actually create procedural steps in an easier format. Um, and in some cases, this is a good and bad thing. Uh, the problem with this is, is that you couldn't version it. 
So in other words, you had to remember if you moved it, your system to another system or if you moved your bill to another build, you would have to remember all the steps that were in place or God forbid you, you lost your Jenkins server, you know, your server, the Hudson server, your Jenkins one. You'd have to go back in and reconfigure everything. And that included probably a lot of screenshots and a lot of notes and things like that. It wasn't very flexible. You know, like I said, non-versionable, uh, it's not automatable. Uh, you, you couldn't automate these builds to do what you wanted to do. Okay, so it really wasn't, it was a precursor to DevOps, but it really wasn't DevOps ready. It would take another set of generations of people to come in and actually start working with it to say, what have we lost and what have we gained? And in this case, what we lost was the simplicity behind actually having a scripting air variables and being able to build a scripting system. But at the same time, we gained the knowledge in which we knew procedural steps were better and a better way to do things. Then came along in 2016, the, you know, the idea of Jenkins pipelines. And that brought back the idea of building out, you know, being able to actually go out and build scripts. Now the scripts weren't exactly like an XML and stuff. It's more of like a JSON format where you could just, you know, but it, a very loose scripting language where you could build out your stages, where you could actually figure out what you wanted to you know, do in each one of these very, you know, very flexible. It allowed you to build it out and build it out the way you wanted to. And like I said, later on, I'm going to be going through a couple that I've written with the people here at JFrog, and we'll talk about what you can do and how um, you can actually, even if you have already your own um, scripts that you might have for your pipelines, how easy, once you have Artifactory in place and you have the plugin installed, how easy it is for you to seed um, that information into um, Artifactory and then have it contextually aware inside of Jenkins to produce more metadata and, and amazing amounts of metadata. And we'll go through that metadata to show you um, what you gain uh, by having Jenkins and also Artifactory uh, together. It's extendable, it's, it's everything you want to do. And the best part too is, one of the things we talked about, um, I brought up before, is that now you can actually treat all these Jenkins files as a source code. So you can version it, you, you can look back, you can make changes. If your server goes down, setting it back up is very straightforward and easy. Um, and it allows you to pump more variables, more information in. It allows you to you know, build out the system that you've really desired. And you can make, put it down to a very you know, micro level on that control. Configuration is code. My opinion is extremely flexible, yes. Boxes are nice but code is, is way more robust because the constraints aren't as, as drastic. So if you want, you know, eventually, and what we'll do is that we'll share this out. Uh, you can go to our, our, our GitHub. Um, and in GitHub, we have a series of, of DSL plug, you know, basically extensions. And we have good examples of how you can use Artifactory and Jenkins together and how to build that code out and how to use it more effectively. Um, we'll share that later on and you can go take a look, but it's, you know, we have a whole thing for our Jenkins Artifactory plugin. We have tons of examples. Let's talk about the age of binaries. You know, one of the things is why is Artifactory Artifactory? What need does it fill? And also too, let's just talk about the progression of time, um, you know, in the way things have, you know, changed and where we stand uh, you know, in, in the world of DevOps and now in the future and, and now the way things are DevSecOps, you know, now you have development, um, you have, you know, security and you have operations conjoined together. Um, and, you know, if for somebody you can tell from my gray hair on my beard here, well, more white, I guess, um, you know, I've been doing this for a while. And, and, you know, the painful days long ago where the, you know, they were exciting, but they were painful. There was many processes, there was many things in place that took a while to do. It took, um, you know, now things have come together. Now there's actually tooling companies like JFrog, like with Jenkins, you know, out in the world that have made this, you know, all this development more agile, fresh, fast, uh, being able to, you know, go forward. Um, for me personally, I'm a, I'm a big believer in 12 factors. If you, if you ever get a chance to take a look, look at 12 factors, in my opinion, every organization should run in this kind of methodology. So first of all, you had Agile, and Agile really changed things a lot. Before, everything was these giant waterfall monolithic um, quarterly releases where you'd spend two or three weeks planning and then you know, taking those and then you know, maybe four to six weeks of development and then another two to three weeks of QA and then finally release. Um, it, it was fine, 
you know, we didn't know any better. And then the Agile method came along, you know, move fast, come up with quick sprints and epics and stories and allowed you to do, you know, releases faster, which allowed you to, you know, address features and bugs and everything it was great. Uh, it changed everything. But the thing is, is that the tool sets weren't really there to meet, you know, what you needed to do. Then came along CI, which actually took a big burden off of the developer, being able to, you know, add in more regression style testing on top of that, and, and then using CI servers to automate the build. So if you had other teams, other dependencies, you could throw it into a CI system and have that build out. Then came distribution, and that was even better. So now you went from having a continuous integration and building that out, and then be able to take it and then distribute it. Now, when I say distribute, it could be anything from like one team sharing to another, or you know, all the way up to production. It doesn't make a difference. It's still that whole idea of continuous delivery. So now, as I went through the process, I could automate more and more, and as I automated more and more, it allowed development to come faster and faster. You know, from there, it, you know, then the need came for something like DevOps, and now all of a sudden development and operations needed its own category because the tools and the development and the distribution and the release all became so ingrained with each other that you no know, that needed to be addressed from there and then microservices came along. You know, my previous life before JFrog, um, you know, the past five years before this was all about developing and building out microservices. Uh, you know, it became really essential is that, you know, why build a monolithic structure when you can build a series of microservices that perform certain tasks, allowing you to concentrate on the certain tasks and come up with better, pro you know, micro products as a, you know, which is a, a holistically a larger product but allowed you to address more, address things faster, and also more consistency. And once again, you could bring it all together and, and put it, you know, and have these built so that you can have uh, less, you know, bugs. Not only I say less bugs, there's always bugs, but, um, you know, a little more control over your, your dev over time. And then from there, Docker was, in my opinion, changed everything for me. Um, you know, the ability, like I said, I was mentioning 12 factors before, and it fits into that, the whole idea of, you know, for me, Personally, I like to develop in Docker containers, you know, on my desktop, which are the same builds that I have in my remote servers. So this way I never get that, it works on my machine. Um, I would always talk to my guys in my previous organizations and say, hey, this is the way we need to develop. And the reason why we need to develop this way is that it cuts down on that whole um, idea of it works on my machine, it doesn't work on other. If anybody out there has worked on Node and NPM, you know that uh, if you build something on a Mac, uh, and you have your thing running on a Mac, sometimes moving it over to, say, an Ubuntu uh, server, it, you can run into a lot of issues. So by having it so you develop in the same image on your desktop as your remote instance cuts down on that. And I used to always say to my developers, you always develop inside of a Docker container. And then when you export it, you export it out and you put that into, you know, the same Docker image is the same Docker image from your machine as someone we have in production. And then last but not least, now with the world, um, you know, IoT, um, I'm a guy that's been in IoT, I hate to say it, since, you know, 2006. Uh, I had a company that did that. And with IoT, you know, the vision that we had back in 2006 is now actually coming to be. You know, the whole idea is that everything is, a, you know, everything is a device. Yes, that's great. But that also means tons of binaries, tons, you know, along the way, the number of binaries has increased as the, you know, as this funnel increases. And that's the reason why we say it's the age of binaries. When you get to IoT, uh, if you think about the number of devices in the world and the number of firmware, the number of software components, uh, managing controllers, you know, device controllers, um, device management systems, when it comes down to it, all those intricacies, all those pieces, all those things are binaries. As the funnel goes up from the initial, you know, days of having the monolithic waterfall approach into Agile, as that all started, the number of binaries have increased. And that's where something like JFrog comes in. And that's what we were there for. You know, this company started back uh, in 2008 as a way to, you know, a small project as a way to manage binaries. And the thing is, is that as it goes, we've gone up. And the thing is, is the, if we look at the amazing amount of binaries that are being stored now, it's incredible. And just, you know, IoT will just expand upon that and extrapolate upon that tenfold as, the, you know, the decade progresses. You know, when you're living in a, in a container world, so we know we're, let's go back to what we were originally talking about, and the main topic of this conversation is is Docker. You know, and and the thing with Docker is is that it, it you know it's a perfect example in my opinion, and Kubernetes is just an extension of this, and other things going forward is you know the whole you know it answered the microservices question, but the thing is though is that in a typical container scenario, 
uh, you're very limited in the amount of metadata that you have behind it. And what we've done here at JFrog is by having you know, your own Docker registry in your own Artifactory instance allows you to have that massive amount of metadata that you can have to make better decisions, better choices, trace problems. And, and we'll go through that in the demo that we have. And I'll show you uh, a perfect example of where things can go sideways. So here we have, you know, we talk about metadata in the age of binary. So before, when we talked about this massive amount of, of binaries, having the metadata to do it, it's, you know, if you were to try to search somehow without metadata, it would take you forever. Um, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, search functionality and not having that metadata, uh, a lot of blind searches, a lot of grepping, a lot of awk, you know, a lot of finding and searching and, and, and just looking. Um, you know, but you know, where is it deployed? You know, tracing binaries back to their sources. So say you have a project that you built and you don't have that metadata constraints behind it where you can go into it, dive into it, look at it, and try to figure out where it's being used, how it's being used, or where did it even come from is, is a problem that we're trying to address here. And the metadata behind that allows you to make those conscious decisions. You know, and then also too is when you're going through is being able to look at the builds you have and, you know, like I said, you know, the more data you have, the more information you have, the better choices you make in most cases. Some people don't. <laughs> but the thing is, though, is that if you pick the right ones, you, you know, it can help ensure. But also, too, if something does go sideways, something does go wrong, having that system of record behind it, having that metadata behind it allows you to trace it back, fix it, and, and maybe resolve it faster because the thing is is that it cuts down the amount of time and the amount of reverse knowledge you need to do because it's presented to you so if you're working with metadata it's it's really essential to make sure that it's consistent you know like i said before what does artifactory what does jfrog do it's simplicity you know set it up easy get it running uh, set it and forget it the ron popeel method of of kind of getting your devops instruction you know that's a i guess a you know this is me it's a u.s thing anyway ron popeel was a guy who created a bunch of stuff and basically said i built stuff set it forget it don't worry about it i'm going to take this out of your life same idea consistency by providing you with information that's consistent across your organization and then last but not least security now security can have different aspects of that you know, down to the idea of scanning and looking for things nefarious, but also the security and knowledge and knowing where everything came from. So having that reverse capability to look back with speculation and say, oh my God, this is where it came from. Also too, add it to your organization. So with Artifactory, not only is it the data is produced by Jenkins, not only is the information produced by say Docker, but you can actually layer more relevant pertinent information from your organization on top of that. And by having that additional metadata on top of that, it allows you to even you know, consolidate it more and make it easily sourceable, easily searchable, uh, and, and just more malleable on overall. You know, the thing is, is that you have, you know, having a single source of truth cuts down on the amount of searching research and, and stuff that you need to do. Being able to, like I said, build custom metadata. So the thing is, is that, not only metadata in the fact of, like I said, what's produced, but also too, even in the CI system, being able to put more additional metadata in to maybe let you know where something is in inside of your internal pipelines. You know, is it from the developer all the way to production? And you know, where, what stage is it in? What gate has it passed? As we talked about before, quality gates, you could add additional metadata on top of that to produce a system of record to follow that. Also, too, you know, it allows you to do, you know, implicit metadata searching. How many times has it been downloaded? Has it been used? Where has it been used? You know, has it been used at all? Uh, who wrote it? What kind of license is associated to it? Uh, you say you have a third-party library, and, you know, you pull it in. It might do what you need it to do, but maybe it's not properly formatted. It might, have a it might not have a proper license. And maybe your organization needs to have a license structure behind it before it uses any sort of, any sort of binary at all. Um, it could be something like a NPM package. You might have a node module, and it might be the perfect node module. You've never seen anything more perfect in your life, but the thing is is that it has no license, not even like an MIT, GPL, or anything like that, and suddenly your organization, you know, your internal security audit team comes to you screaming saying, yeah, but this is perfect, and they go, no, no, well, it has no license. We can't make sure or ensure uh, the value behind this that somebody might come and get us later. You know, your compliance department might you know, string you up and use you as an example. You know, consuming metadata is the other thing too. So 
we have produced a couple of different ways to do things. Um, you can use our CLI tool to add properties, pull properties, do things like that. But we've created a thing called the you know, Artifactory Query Language. Now, that's built around the idea of being able to query all this data. You can use our UI that we have inside of Artifactory itself. Um, but if you want more complex, more robust uh, queries, you would use something like AQL. It's a JSON-based syntactual language um, that allows you to execute it against our API, and it produces information back that you can make intelligent choices and intelligent decisions. And you know, we'll include the reference here. It's, we have it on our wiki. Um, one thing about JFrog is, is that if you ever need to know anything about our product, uh, if you've used it before, you know that we expose our API, our wiki. Uh, we have access. There's a bunch of information in Stack Overflow, a developer's best friend, my, one of my favorite places in the world to go. Uh, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but also, too, we have webinars and tutorials. But AQL is a very, very powerful tool in which you can do things. Um, Finding out if a binary has been downloaded in the six, you know, past six months. What's the most downloaded, you know, piece of material out of Artifactory? You know, all that information is available. How many times has it been used? Um, where did it come from? Why is it being used? If you remove it from your Artifactory system, what is it impacting? Um, all these things are apparent. Now, the thing is, is that Artifactory, and I want to make sure um, that I back up for one quick second. So the Artifactory, the way it works is, is that our system is based on a checksum-based storage. So the thing is, is say you, you have um, a Java project and you're using commons.io 4.4.6. I'm just throwing some number out there. And that's used across a thousand projects. We only store that actual library once. And we reference it via metadata. So this way, when you do perform those queries, you can produce and figure out exactly where that image, you know, that binary might be used. And even if you remove it from, say, one repo, and it's you know, dependent in another, we'll make sure that we'll actually keep that in that same, uh, you know, the same format and available for the other projects. So even if you deleted that in one repo, it will not be removed from the other. So let's continue on. Tracing builds. This is always a nightmare with a lot of companies. Yes, I will say this. If you go into Jenkins, there's an amazing amount of the metadata. And the metadata comes to you in this gigantic console log format. And you look at that console log format, and yeah, it's great. What we do is, is that, you know, when you're doing this, you know, how do you know which Docker image, you know, Docker image contains your application file? Things like that when you're using especially Jenkins and Docker together. You know, how do you know where the application file is contained in the you know what layer and, and where you know where is that in there? Well, and we're going to talk about that also. Um, so let's let's go talk about you know I'm going to do a quick share here. Let me stop sharing this screen here. And let me go into my Artifactory server. So here's Artifactory. Um, if you guys have never seen it before, I recommend uh, you know taking a look at it. We have trials available. You can actually just go to uh, our Artifact, you know, go to JFrog site, follow it down. We offer a 30-day trial of our enterprise product. Um, if you look here, um, this is Artifactory. I'm just going to do a quick tour, five second, you know, five minute tour. Um, so you know, here's the dashboard. You can do a quick search. Uh, like I said before, here's all our items here that we might have for, you know, like our user guide, our webinars, uh, support portal, Stack Overflow, our REST API, helpful guides at the bottom, um, quick set me up anytime you have anything inside of Artifactory, um, unless I'm logged in. Um, you can actually, you know, like I talked about simplicity before, um, we make it extremely easy for you to set up and use Artifactory, no matter what kind of uh, tool that you're using. But if you look over here, Oh, we have an area for builds. So let's navigate the build information for a second. Um, I'll actually, let me show you what my build looks like. So actually in this case, I've got a, um, I've got a, you know, a pipeline here. Uh, it's a standard one. Um, I've, you know, I pulled some dependencies out of Artifactory. Um, I build those dependencies, uh, you know, into my, into my Docker container. I deploy it back into Artifactory because that's my uh, Docker registry. Then I have a quick test that I do, and the test in this case, I look inside of the artifact, you know, this Docker container, and I see that inside of there, I actually have a, 
Um, I look for a, a particular value. If it does, if I find it, I, I add additional metadata back into Artifactory to let me know that I found it, that it passed my QA functional test. From there, I hand it off to X-Ray. So I actually, X-Ray is a separate uh, product from JFrog, and I, it literally pulls that Docker container into the product, tears it apart down this finalist granular level, and I'll show you the results from that, and it scans for anything nefarious. And then last, I do a promotion. And in this case, I'm promoting, I'm promoting from my development repository into a production repository for consumption. So what would this, you know, what does this look like? What does this uh, Jenkins file look like? Well, um, let me just do, let me bring this up here. Here's the actual Jenkins file itself. So I talked about before that Jenkins is contextually aware. So if you go into Jenkins and you want to add in Artifactory, if you have an Artifactory instance, it's as simple as just going, you know, going to the plugins inside of, of Jenkins and actually adding the Artifactory plugin. Once the Artifactory plugin is installed, you can configure uh, your Jenkins server. So let's go in here and I'll show you. And it's as easy as, as soon as it loads, pointing it to my Artifactory server. So in this case, I'm actually, you know, I'm pointing to a Jenkins server that I have running on my machine in this case. And like I said, it's contextually aware of, of you know, who I am, you know, who Artifactory is. Let's go back here for a second and let's look at this build. And you know, here's the pipeline. I'll show you the stages. So if you look here, like I said, the plugin, it's a very you know, standard groovy DSL plugin that you would have for, um, you know, for Jenkins. And if you look here, I'm able to determine that I'm actually passing it. Some, anytime you see, by the way, the uppercase uh, things here, these are actually, when I'm building these, these are actually um, you know, parameters that I've defined um, that I'm passing in. And if you look here, uh, here's Artifactory. I'm passing in my Artifactory URL in this case because I'm gonna keep it separate because the thing is is that I wanna have this so that it's versioned. Like I said, this is inside of uh, my Git repo uh, and I'm looking at it and everything's fine. So now that I have, uh, I have a server, I'm gonna actually take the build information. Now, the Artifactory plugin gathers all that build data from Jenkins and prepares it as an object. And it passes that object off through the various stages into Artifactory as a system of record. So let me show you what we do here. And then I'll go back and I'll show you the results. So if you look here, I'm gathering the dependencies. In this case, I've actually got a WAR file uh, that I produced in the previous build. And I'm going to tell you right now, this uh, WAR file is a masterpiece of disaster. Um, it's filled with, uh, one of the biggest things is there was that issue with struts that happened uh, about two months ago. Um, that stretch jar is in here and it is a, a security nightmare. And I did that on purpose because I want to scan it inside of Artifactory, uh, I mean X-Ray, to show you the results as part of the stages. Now, this is great because when I'm building these containers, you know, there's many, many different layers of, our, you know, inside of, of the Docker components, and I'll show you the results of what this looks like and how we store it and how you can break it down. And then from there, last step after this, I'll show you how I have a different project and I promoted it to Bintray and how we show that Docker image and how you can consume it. Let's go back to this for a minute. So I pull the Docker, um, you know, I pull the WAR file in. Um, I've got those dependencies now. And now I'm doing a standard Docker build. Um, I'm using the Docker pl build plugin. Um, I have some metadata around that. When I'm done doing the build, I'm actually pushing this back into Artifactory um, because I am using Artifactory as my Docker registry. So we have RT, Docker, Artifactory. And then I'm taking it, I'm pulling that image back because um, I want to test it. And I'm actually, I, I have a thing uh, in here where I'm actually doing a quick test where I say test the app. I have a function down here where I'm actually just looking inside of my, uh, my Docker image here and I'm looking for a particular um, you know, value. If I find it, I'm actually updating a metadata property called QA functional test equals pass. If it fails, I will still update a property and now these metadata properties are metadata properties inside of Artifactory. So this is part of the system of record where I can customize not only the build information that I've generated in Jenkins, but I've actually now added additional metadata into it. And then lastly, I'm taking this, sorry about that, 
second to last actually, and I'm taking it and I'm actually passing it <coughs> off to my x-ray product to have it scanned. I'm not doing anything in this case with the result results because like I said, it's a really bad WAR file um, uh, that has a lot of stuff in it. I'm just printing out the results and I can show you the results later. And then last but not least, I, you know, once it passed my test, if it did, in this case, if I did set it up, this would not pass in any way. Uh, and things that you can do, by the way, with an x-ray is you can send an email alert for anything found. You can hook it up to a webhook. So if you have any third-party monitoring systems that you would do for your process that you want to alert somebody. And also, too, you can send a CI termination event to say, terminate the CI process, send notifications, and alert somebody that this build is bad because there's a security, possible security breach. But if it did pass, then we could take it from a source repository and promote it into a promotion repository. So now put it into a different repository um, for consumption. Since we're going along on time here, um, when I produce the build, we'll take a look here. Um, you know, like uh, if I ran this, uh, you know, I'll, I'll have it you know, run in the background. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to go in and we're going to go take a look at, say, you know, this last build that we did, which is right here. And let's go look at build number nine. You can see that the other one has been, fin has been finished. Now, here's a system of record that we have for Artifactory in terms of this container build, right? So this Jenkins job ran. It, it built uh, the product. It stored the Docker image itself. So the Docker image is actually stored in Artifactory. And here's the, you know, the information. So here's the repository and where it was stored. And it was a pipeline job. Here's a link back directly to the job itself. Here are all the modules that were published uh, at the, you know, for this. So here's the Docker uh, build that I did. And we have a massive amount of data. So here's the artifacts that were created from this build. Here's the list of dependencies for that build. And they come in as a bunch of SHAs. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, you know, the whole idea behind that, by the way, that's the, that's the checksum storage of how these artifacts are produced. And if you know, some, if you know how Docker works and how images work, uh, it works in a series of container of layers, right? And then those get pulled together into an actual image itself. Those are the layers themselves. Now, we'll go take a look at this in a minute, but let's continue inside the build information. So here's the environmental variables that were associated to it. So this is all the Jenkins information, the job information. Um, all those pieces there that we you know that we've actually um, stored. Here is any of the variables that you know we you know we have during that. So like everything down to um, Java versions and things like that. You know this lets me know if this they found if any issues have been found. Remember before I was talking about licenses when that this WAR file that I'm placing in here webservice.war is a nightmare because like I said it has no license associated to it. So that could be a red flag for somebody. Now, my favorite feature of being able to do this and, and try to do this outside of Artifactory, and it's near impossible, is that I can go through and I can compare builds. Um, so I can do actually do a diff between two versions of, of Docker, and I can see what's changed, everything from the layers um, down to the dependencies, even down to the environmental variables. And it gives me this massive amount of metadata in which I can make better choices. So if something goes wrong in build number nine, I, and it was working build number eight, I can actually trace back and, and you know, it won't give me the exact area to look at, but it will narrow it down enough so that when I go talk to my developers and say, you changed this or this changed, and I can tell I have, I have the, a good starting point to look at. It's a good primer to go back and do your tracing. And lastly, I talked about how I promoted this. So I took this build and I promoted it to a production repository. And I have a metadata that I showed here. If you look, I changed the value to release, so it status is released. And we reflected that here as released. Now, like all things with Artifactory, um, like all things with Artifactory, our UI is a simple Angular 2 UI layered on top of our API. So our API is the most powerful part. So now the big thing with this is, is that all that information is also available as a strict Java, you know, JSON object. So if you were to query the build inside of Artifactory, you would get back this massive amount of metadata. If you have your own system in which you want to parse this, or if you want to put this somewhere else, or parse through it and pull out what's important to you, you can. It's all available to you. Now let's take a look at what the artifacts that were produced in this are, right? 
So I'm just going to go into uh, Artifactory itself. And if you look here, you can see this is build number nine. Okay. And in build number nine, you can see this is actually the, the one that was stored. Now let's go take a look at the, you know, if you look here, you can see a direct link to this. Uh, I can look at the artifact count. So this is a 416 megabyte um, image that I created. Here is the execution path of all the Docker tag values that were done during this Docker build. And we can actually, we actually break it down so that you can look and trace and, and see everything that was executed while this Docker container was being processed. You could change the permissions on who um, you know, actually has visibility to this, who can use it, what can they do with it. Um, remember I was talking about metadata properties. So one of the things I said is, is that when I ran this build, if it passed my QA functional test, I was going to add that metadata. And if I go into Artifactory, I can see the metadata that was produced in this. And I can see how this was affected. And I can say, oh look, it did pass my test. Um, I can also just take a look here and if I had watchers, so I can watch builds to see, I can create watchers around those. That's a whole nother discussion. But I can look at watchers that were created around that and I could take that information and I can extrapolate it and have notifications built around it. Um, let's go back and look at something quickly because I want to get onto the security aspect of this, of how you're doing things inside of Artifactory. So if you take a look here, I scanned this with X-ray. I didn't do anything with the results, but I did receive that there was something critical in this, and I know this. Um, and because for expedience of time, we only have about 15 minutes left, and I'd like to get some questions in, um, let me show you X-ray quickly. So this is X-ray. X-ray is another product. We have some CV, you know, here's some like alerts. It's connected to an instance. I could do a whole just discussion around this. Well, let's just go take a look at something for a second. Let's look at some critical data. So here's some critical information um, that I found here. I talked about this as a nasty war file. And if you look here, this found the struts issue. This is the struts issue that a certain credit company in the world um, had some vulnerabilities with about a month and a half ago. Now, when we did the scanning, I told you, when we pull that image in, we tear it apart, we go down to its finest level inside granularity inside of this Docker container. And if you look here, here's the Docker app. <coughs> Sorry, here's the doc, here's the, you know, here's the actual, um, the Docker container. Here's that layer inside of Docker. So I talked about before, uh, you know, if I were to do an inspect of this Docker container, it would show the layers. This is the layer itself in which the actual issue is happening. Here's the WAR file inside of that layer. Here's the problem. And then lastly, here's the exact cause. Here's the exact root of the problem. This is the struts problem. Now, if I go in and I take a look, I just happen to bring this up because like I said, I want to keep this where it's at. If I take a look at the struts problem that we have here, here's all the CVE data and there's a massive amount um, behind what it is. And if you take a look, you can see that it's critical. Now, that's great and all. I can look at the licensing, I can look at the location on where it's being used. But my thing that it really, really impacts it the most is I can now go back and say, what previous versions of Artifactory, you know, what previous versions of this did the struts issue affect? So now I can go back and address all the particular versions that I might have inside of, of, of my builds. So I can address those security issues as needed and quickly. Now, since we do it, we, I, you know, I'm gonna talk for another three minutes or so, um, you know, I did another build, and I'll show you the other build. I did this quick IoT build that I was doing for a, uh, a testing system that I was doing. And if you go in here, I've got, you know, I've got my standard Docker file, I've got my Jenkins file, and the Jenkins file is very similar in this case um, to the one I was doing there. It's got a bunch of, you know, different things I'm doing. Um, when I'm done, uh, in this case, if I go into my pipeline, and I look, and let's go into my IoT build here, um, I'm doing the same kind of idea. It's a bigger build because I was doing a bunch of serious testing. Um, the biggest difference here is though, at the end, I'm actually taking this and I'm actually promoting this uh, to a remote repository. And the remote repository in this case is our bin tray product. Now, if I go into our bin tray product, which I had here a minute ago, let me see here, bintray.com, and let me sign in. 
Let me go in here for a minute. And if I go in and I produced a build yesterday, um, well, actually, I think it was last night, or I could produce any of these builds, or this one's from a couple of weeks ago. Um, I can go in and, and, you know, here's a, this is actually a Docker build, by the way, too. Um, and I can go through and I can look at the versions, right? So this is a Docker container that I was using. And once again, we break down all those runtime components into an easily digestible, um, you know, component that we can look at. So you can do things like search on a layer for checksum or anything like that. But we can also go through and look at statistics and let's look for the past year. And one of the cool things about this, um, actually I did this test when I was inside of Berlin, I believe. Uh, yeah. And I actually performed a series of downloads and builds while I was in Berlin. And I can trace where this Docker container now is being used. Now I can push all that metadata back into Artifactory. So now I have the ability to track metadata on artifacts and binaries from the developer and in, say in the IoT world all the way through the device. I've now covered the gamut and I have a mixture of metadata that can be used across the board. And that allows me to make better decisions as a corporation. That allows me to have better tracking, traceability and accountability for my products. And then a way for me to go through and be able to generate reports and builds and other things like that. So what we've learned today, and I hope this has helped out, um, I might have taken a little longer than I wanted, and I'd rather show practical examples, but the whole thing is, is that by having Artifactory, Docker, and all these components all mixed together and being able to pull, tra track, and trace, I now have a system of record. I have a way to manage the unruly world of binaries. I have the ability to have a secure product and have a product in which I can build out queries and, and, tr and be able to have accountability as an organization. Um, I think I got pretty much through everything I wanted to talk about, and I guess I should now, it's 8.20, or my time, it's uh, still in the morning, sun's just coming up a few minutes an hour ago. Um, I guess I can open up the floor for the discussion, Katarina, I'm not sure how to do this, is that something you do or I do? <laughs> Anyone? I hope this was helpful. Have any questions out there? Or should I keep talking about stuff? What do you think? Anybody? <laughs> can you hear me, Bill? Oh, I can hear you. Oh, you okay. Sorry, I had a problem with my microphone. Sorry. Uh, so if anyone has a question, um, you can type your question in the question and answer chat field at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we are happy to answer it. If uh, anything comes to your mind um, after the call, please contact us by email and we are happy to um, reply to you. So uh, the question is, will there be a recording? Yes, we have recorded the session. So we will send you an email after this webinar with a link uh, to our YouTube channel where we publish the video. Um, Bill, a question for you. Um, do you have an equivalent plugin with the GitLab CI? We have integrations into it. We don't have a direct plugin per se yet, but it will. Um, we will have that. That's in our, and we do have it as a roadmap item to support that in the future uh, for, GitLab, for, for GitLab, from what I understand. Um, what is it? What is included in the free version of Artifactory? Uh, out of all that has been shown. Um, so with the free version, the OSS version, you can use generic repositories and if you're doing any sort of Maven projects, if you're doing any sort of Java projects. Um, the thing is, if you're a small developer and like I was previous to, our, to this and you have a small corporation or an independent developer and you want to do more, um, I would recommend looking at our SaaS product. That's what I did when I had my own independent um, where I couldn't afford to have my own de dedicated Artifactory server. I actually went with the SaaS version so that my organization could operate and use Artifactory uh, for a cheaper price. Um, let's see here. Uh, what should we, why should we use the CLI over something like curl? Um, so, okay, so the thing is, is that curl is great if you want to use it for, you know, if you want to use that, if you want to, you know, push data or information out. CLI is a tool that was developed by us for us for this product specifically. Uh, it's easy to configure. It's easy to use. Also, too, it's checksum aware, 
Um, so in other words, when you're using it, it's very tightly integrated into the actual Artifactory product. So there are there is some um, data that is inherent in the, in the actual CLI tool that's relevant uh, to Artifactory. So in a way, it actually makes it a little easier to use than curl. Um, and you can also um, do things, uh, you know, it's, it, simplicity in the commands. So in other words, if you want to copy, push, publish, push build information and things like that, it's simply a command line argument as opposed to having to add in additional curl uh, parameters and stuff. But if you're using a uh, something like Python or if you're using some other uh, language where you can script it out, um, then go ahead and use the API with curl if you want to. Or whatever method you use for posting, getting, and setting. Um, is it possible to have Artifactory cluster on multiple sites, absolutely. Um, the way that would work is, I mean, if you if you have Artifactory set up uh, using, like, say, our enterprise license, that would be more HA that allows you to do replication across multiple sites. You can control what gets replicated across those sites. Um, we have a bunch of information. Actually, what we'll do is um, I, I'll, I'll show you if you want some information on that. I actually, let's see, I'll bring it up right now, um, and I'll share it as a chat item. But we have a, a white paper. Um, in which we wrote, so I'll put this in the chat over here for a minute. Um, let's see here, to all participants. If you'd like to read up on our topology, uh, we have a whole bunch of documentation on that. And let's see, binary, let's see, bin tray versus Docker Hub slash store. Okay, so the thing with bin tray, so the thing is if you're already, if you're an Artifactory customer as it is, then I would, rec you know, you already have um, made up your mind about Docker Hub. In other words, you decided that you want to actually use Artifactory as your Docker registry, then bench tray would be the natural progression in that, right? So if you were to do that, you can either, you know, if you want to push up to bench tray and have a consumption where you can control um, the amount of downloads and the way things are downloaded, that's great. Um, Docker Hub and the store are, are still are great. Uh, you can still do promote, you know, if you want to promote it up, but if you've already decided um, to use Artifactory as your as your Docker registry, stay within the side of the product, I guess. But you could also still put it back to the store if you want. Um, so you still have that ability and that option. Um, yeah, I think I just did that. Uh, any other questions? I think I've answered people. I hope it was. I hope this was helpful. Um, let's see here. Anything else while you got me? I don't like think I've I said, covered uh, everything, but we, I think I did. A, I think I yeah. pretty much covered what I could in the time frame. Yeah, I think uh, you did. And if anything else is coming to your mind, uh, feel free to drop us an email. We are always happy to uh, set up a technical session dedicated um, to you as well. So yeah, contact us uh, for for any further info. Thank you very much, Bill, for your time and uh, um, all the great info you, you gave everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining, and I wish everyone a great remaining day or afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, bye guys. Bye. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye.